Good afternoon. My name is Heather Engel, and I'm the Associate Vice President for Gift Planning here at the University of Virginia. On behalf of UVA clubs and the Office of Gift Planning, I would like to welcome you to a conversation surrounding charitable giving, articulating values, and maximizing your impact. I would like to invite our panelists to turn on their cameras. We are very lucky to be joined today by Adrian Penta, Karen Prangley, and Nicole Jackson, all from Brown Brothers Harriman. Adrian is the executive director of the BBH Center for Women and Wealth and oversees BBH's private banking, marketing, and sales enablement. She has substantial expertise in values-based planning and regularly assists individuals and families in making decisions about wealth to align with their values and their objectives. Adrian is a graduate of Johns Hopkins University and received her JD from the University of Virginia School of Law. Karen Prangley is a senior wealth planner in BB&H's Chicago private banking office. She has spent her entire career advising successful individuals and business owners on the preservation of wealth. Karen's particular expertise ranges from saving income and estate taxes on the sale of a business to assisting clients with the achievement of their philanthropic goals, to preparing the next generation to inherit wealth. She received a BA from Mount St. Mary's University and a JD from the University of Virginia School of Law. Nicole Jackson is a BBH wealth planner and provides guidance to individuals and families throughout all aspects of their estate planning, including generational transfer of family wealth, tax minimization strategies, business succession, philanthropy, and the engagement of the next generation. Nicole is also involved in many of the firm's initiatives surrounding diversity, equity, and inclusion. She is a graduate of Northeastern University and received her JD from the University of Virginia School of Law. Thank you to everyone who submitted questions prior to our discussion. For those of you who have questions during the presentation, the Q&A feature in Zoom allows you to submit them. With that, I would like to invite our panelists to turn on their mics. And Adrian, I will turn it over to you so that we can begin. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, and I will say on behalf of my colleagues, we are all devoted UVA graduates. And so we are thrilled to be here for this event today and so glad to be with all of you. Um, there is not much that we would not do for UVA. So thank you for inviting us to be here. Um, technology is not my strong suit. So <laughs> Nicole, I think you have the slides that we've prepared and maybe we could start just with that one um, page on introductions so you can um, beyond our bios, you can know just a little bit more about us and who we are. And, and here's what that looks like for all of you. And I'm sure some of you are graduates of the law school. Um, I'm sure some of these um, favorite UVA memories <laughs> might resonate um, with others of you. I'm actually man, um, married to a UVA law classmate. Um, so we have a really strong um, dedication and affiliation with the school. We were just in Virginia this past weekend, actually. Um, you will also be able to tell, and we won't take a poll because it's maybe a little bit too obvious about who studied the hardest in law school um, based on our favorite memories. Um, so we, we won't go there, but um, we're we're really, we're really happy to be here. And this is a topic that's near and dear to all of us. We all enjoy um, talking with clients and counseling them on how to maximize the impact for both themselves and for charity of their, of their charitable gifts as well as um, how they might think about engaging the next gen, other members of their family and being really thoughtful and intentional about giving. And all of us sit on boards and are all philanthropic ourselves. So it is really um, a wonderful topic to be with all of you today. So my portion of this, the next section is on charitable mission and how do you think about giving before you even, um, you know, before you even put pen to paper on that check, writing to a charity um, or even selecting the charity how do you think more broadly about why you give? So Nicole, the next slide, the first slide we have here, what is charitable mission? 
Um, and I think that sometimes this word mission is a little bit intimidating. We think, well, the Gates Foundation has a mission. The American Red Cross has a mission. My family, I don't necessarily have a mission uh, in how I give to the charities that are important to me, but we all do, whether it's expressed or if it's just held in your, in your heart or your mind, we all have a mission. We all have um, an, an, a reason why we give. Nobody's obliged to give to charity. Nobody's obliged to give back to you yeah, even though I think most of us probably do. So the question is, why do we give? And the more intentional families can be about why they give, I think that there are some really, really positive outcomes. The first is focused. None of us have unlimited resources. Even the Gates Foundation doesn't have unlimited resources. Even very, very large charitable entities do not have unlimited resources. So the more focused we can be about the work that we are doing with our charitable giving, the better off we can be and the more impact we can make for those around us and the, the recipients of our charitable giving. The other one is legacy. Do you anticipate that your giving might extend beyond your lifetime or your partner's lifetime? In that case, charitable mission is absolutely critical in order to have this work go on after you are no longer here to do it yourself. The third is awareness, and I would say that this cuts both ways. It's both awareness of what you do and what you do not do in terms of charitable work. This can be very helpful if you want to say no to a specific gift. You know, a friend is running a race or doing um, some charity work or is really engaged in another organization that's just not that important to you. Might be great work, it probably is, but it's not within um, your, the scope of your own charitable giving, your own charitable work. It's helpful to say, well, you know, my focus is here, so I'm not able to give at this time or in the way that you're asking. And then finally, impact. So impact is, is the big one and a big theme of today's discussion because impact is, um, we, we have to be specific in order to have impact. And I think that when we see families who are charitable, they generally fall into two buckets. One is that they do give to everybody who asks. They do give to a number of organizations that their friends or family members are involved with. And maybe they engage in a little bit more of checkbook philanthropy, of saying, sure, I have a certain amount of money that I'm giving to philanthropy or giving to charity this year, and I'm willing to give it out as folks need it, as they request it. We've had clients in the past that go back and look at their charitable giving and might say to us, well, I don't actually give that much to charity. And we say, well, let's go look at it. Let's take a look at what you're actually doing. And they find that that number actually adds up to a really substantial amount on a yearly basis that they might be giving away. So the question for each of you is, do you wanna be more specific about what the in intended impact of those gifts should be versus just being able to give it as you might, as you might think, you know, as you might decide as the year goes on. So that's, that's one question to ask yourself as you start out on this journey of thinking more strategically about philanthropy. I would also say, if you want to engage your family, whether it be children or the next generation or even grandchildren or other family members, whether it be your spouse or other decision makers in your household, I think having a mission becomes more important because if, it's, if you're engaging in individual giving, then you might give however you deem necessary in accordance with your own set of values and desires. If you're going to engage other people in the giving, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute, it is very helpful to have a set description or list of criteria that will help drive your giving. Not to say that you will always follow it. None of this is, is written in stone. It can change over time and it often does change over time, but to have a set of criteria or principles where you begin the conversation about giving can be very helpful. So moving on to the next slide, thanks Nicole, about who should be involved in this conversation about why we give why we give as a family, why we give as a couple, why we give as individuals. So I think that the philanthropic conversation is an excellent gateway to how you talk to the rest of your family about money or wealth, generally speaking. So if you are philanthropic, and we know that you might be because you're joining us today, I would say use your philanthropy, use your charitable giving to engage others around you. Oftentimes it's the next generation, but it doesn't have to be. So as you think about mission and how you might give, engage the people around you, engage the other folks who you want to be stakeholders in your philanthropy. And don't think about it as narrowly as maybe just you or, 
or, or your spouse. I think even with small children, my kids are little, they're, uh, you know, they're elementary school age. They're really productive conversations that you can start having, even with kids who are not yet in high school or not yet in college and certainly not adults and how they think about philanthropy and why you give. It's the basis of how you make decisions about money and the values that you use. And we'll talk probably a lot more <laughs> about values um, today and how they, how they dictate what we do with our wealth. The quote on the, on the right-hand side here is from our colleague, Ellen Perry, who actually spoke with this morning. Um, and this is a picture of her book, which is available on Amazon if anybody wants to spend more time with it. But she is a big believer, as all of us on the call are today, in using values to form the basis and the core, your sort of set of principles about how you make decisions around wealth. And your values are why, right? They're the why behind why you're making all of these decisions about how you give, how you save, how you invest and how you plan for the future. So if you can start with values and a clear understanding of your values, oftentimes the conversation about mission gets a lot easier. And the other, the other thing that I would say before we, before we leave this slide is that the, the issue that we see very often in families is an assumption that other people in our family are going to carry out our philanthropy in our absence at some point in the future, or are going to participate in that philanthropy with us without being specific about it, without engaging them in a conversation about why we're doing the work and what the mission behind the philanthropy is. So we have a family that I worked with for a very long time. Like many parents, they thought, we're going to leave our children a family foundation. They have four children. They all live in different corners of the United States. We're going to leave this wonderful philanthropic vehicle to our children because we want them all to work together after we are no longer here to do it. So during their lifetime, they created a mission. They gave away a bunch of money. Um, and upon the death of the survivor of the two parents, the, their four children, who are all adults, probably 40 or older at that point, inherited a foundation with the parents' mission that they had thought out in advance. What happened, which is what happens so often, I think, to families who haven't actually pitched a big enough tent in thinking about who they involve in the conversation around mission, is the four children decided that they were going to break that foundation into four pieces and basically take their each individual piece of the foundation because they had too many disagreements about how to execute the mission or what mission they should be executing um, after their parents were no longer there. So first off, I would say you have to teach your kids to work together if you eventually want them to work on a foundation together or be um, successful in giving away money to charities together. And then second, you have to engage them and they have to be bought into what the mission is um, before they in inherit this type of charitable vehicle. Moving on to the next slide. So how do you go about doing this? In, in reality, none of us have unlimited time or resources. How do we actually go about thinking about how to put together a mission? It does not have to be an exhaustive exercise, I would say. This could be some conversations over dinner on Friday night or around the table um, with, your, with your spouse and your children or your partner, whoever you make charitable giving decisions together with. So the first step of this process, I think is actually really, really fun. And to think about what actually gives you joy. One of the great, and I think Nicole and Karen will talk about this as well. One of the great parts of charitable giving is the joy of giving it away while you are here, while you are present, while you are alive and able to make those gifts yourself. So think about what motivates you to give. Why do you want to give? What gifts have you seen in the past? Maybe you've been a recipient of a gift that was really meaningful in your own life, or maybe something happened to you in the course of your life, your childhood, your adolescence that has really shaped what you believe and how you want to execute on your own philanthropy. A question that I really like, and some of them are written up here on the right-hand side, is what is the most satisfying gift you've made? I had a client who was really stuck. He and his wife were really challenged in terms of thinking about mission and trying to figure out how they would bring together all of their charitable interests in, in, in a charitable vehicle. And I asked this one question. We'd been sitting around the table for hours over multiple days. We asked this one question, what's the most satisfying gift you've ever made? And the answer was, 
readily available. They looked at each other and they knew immediately what had been the most important gift that they'd made. And it actually wasn't a gift at all. It was a child that they'd mentored and they had paid for his education, but they had mentored him. They had provided tutoring. They had provided mentorship. They'd provided advice. They provided dinner. And it was a kid in their neighborhood who they just took under their wing, um, who really became very important to their life. And so that type of experiential philanthropy um, or giving back um, it doesn't even have to be philanthropy, really began to shape how they moved forward because they knew immediately what was satisfying to them. They knew immediately how important it had been um, to be um, a positive force in the childhood and the education of this young person. So in thinking about some of these questions, I think it becomes immediately clear what will really bring us joy and why do we want to give? There's some tools and some resources listed on this slide and we can certainly send this out or have it available. We oftentimes use some of the tools that have been created by an organization called 2164. You can go onto their website, you can buy anything you want there. There's a really great tool that we often use at the beginning of the philanthropic journey with clients, um, which is called, what am I inheriting? It can be about wealth generally. It can also be about charitable giving that looks back at what are the experiences that have been most important to you in your childhood um, and growing up and thinking about how you might want to give going forward. And then a couple of these pieces here we've written and are published on bbh.com. If you want to go check those out, you're more than welcome to. Um, and then the last tool on the right is actually a deck of cards. The way that we've depicted it is um, just as a, as a few of the cards, but it's called motivational values. And it's about what are the values that really motivate my behavior and that I want to motivate my behavior going forward. So a really, really great, um, fun, intergenerational potentially exercise that you can do maybe the day after Thanksgiving or whenever you're having these conversations about philanthropy or giving with the people who are important to you. So the next slide is the next step in the process, which is, okay, now that I know what brings me joy in terms of my charitable giving, what I really want to accomplish and why, what can I accomplish? So this is the look forward at the landscape. Um, and how are we going to make a change in the world using the limited um, philanthropic capital that each of us has? So there are certain foundations who I think have done a really lovely job of this. And I've pulled a couple of them out and put their put their mission statements on the page just for a couple examples. I would encourage you to go look at other foundations or other philanthropists that you might admire to see how they are doing it and how they are articulating their own missions. Um, but you have to be narrow. And even a foundation like the Mesos Family Foundation that has lots and lots of resources, right? They're being pretty specific about learning and education, specifically from birth to high school, um, in order to create success for those students. So, you know, as much money as you might have, the problems of the world are large. And we have to think in a little bit of a, a narrower way about what is the problem that we are each individually going to solve. So maybe it's place-based, maybe it's age-based, maybe it's um, a specific disease or a specific problem or a specific type of approach. I think the Manning Foundation does a nice job of this around they're, they're doing innovation in healthcare and innovation and treatments for um, diseases, disruptive diseases as they call them, but they are going to specifically encourage entrepreneurialism with their funding, which is a really interesting, I think, and very specific way to think about what your charitable assets are going to do. However, they go on to say in their, in their, in their mission statement, we're also going to support groups in Charlottesville, because Charlottesville is important to this family, obviously, um, that care about our vision of a thriving community, which is lovely, because just because you have to be narrow doesn't mean that you can't have multiple areas of focus. And many of us do. We care deeply about the places where we've lived, or places we've gone to school, or the communities that we've either been born into or created for ourselves. So just because you have a big charitable mission statement focused on a big um, issue doesn't mean that you can't also be focused on some of the other charitable priorities in your life. Okay, my last slide, and then I'm going to hand it off to my colleagues, um, is the next one. So how do we bring this all together? Once you've figured out what, what is important to you, 
how do we narrow it down and we package it so that we're actually solving a problem that needs to be solved in the world? How do we put it all together? So it is, you know, I would really encourage all of you, whether you're giving individually, whether you're giving $1,000 a year, or whether you're giving lots and lots every year, um, to think about writing something down. Um, Maybe it's just for yourself, maybe it's for your family, maybe it's an exercise you do together with some of the other folks around your table. But to write it down makes it real and it gives you a sense of accomplishment and accountability, I think, and how you and how you come back together, maybe on an annual basis, or some of the families we work with that actually have very large charitable foundations are coming together on a quarterly basis to see how they're tracking their own results. But just to jot it down on a slip of paper or in a journal somewhere to think about what is what it is that you want to accomplish with your giving, I think can be really helpful. Um, the other the other part of this, and we've talked a little bit about it, um, but the question of how do you actually put this into practice after you've written it down and who do you engage and how do you bring um, people together some around charitable giving is is very important and i think that we've written a, a few questions here about that are relevant to the next generation the question that we hear probably most often from our clients who uh, are all wealthy families is how do i make my kids philanthropic how do i make them grateful how do i teach them the values that i care about and oftentimes that is about engaging them and asking them their opinion <laughs> um, and not necessarily teaching it in a way that we think traditionally we might teach values or teach about philanthropy. Um, and we find that families often have the same values. And there's actually been some research done on this, that 90% of the values that all of us have, we learned from our parents and our grandparents. So it might be a little bit of a less scary conversation when you realize that, geez, my kids are likely to have the same values that I have. However, they might externalize them or put them into work in the world in a different way. So just because their values are the same doesn't mean that the preferences and the charities that they might select will be the same as yours. So I would say be open and make that a bigger conversation if you can, if you have the time and the energy to do it. A couple of questions came in, I think, related to this and about how you put charity, put your mission into practice around how do you find the organizations that you actually want to give to? How do you vet those organizations? There's lots of resources out there in the world that have already done a lot of vetting of charities. The most fundamental piece of data that you as an individual can go out and find is the Form 990 that the charity publishes every year. And that has a lot of information in it who's on their board, how much they pay their top executives, what programmatic work they're actually doing. There's a lot in there. So if you can learn to read or if there's an organization you really wanna go deep on, um, very easy to find their Form 990, which is their IRS filing on guidestar.org. The other way that I often actually do this, and I think many of, many of us do, is um, to look at our community foundations and the very charitable, larger organizations in our geographies or where you're focused on giving. So in Boston, for example, the Boston Foundation gives out lots and lots of grants every year. And they have teams and teams of people that work with these organizations, charitable organizations, to ensure that they're being impactful. And they've done a lot of research on exactly how they're doing that and ensuring that they're using the best practices. So I would use everybody, almost everybody everywhere in the United States has a community foundation that's adjacent to them. So rely on those organizations and look at the work that they are doing around what organizations are most impactful. There's also lots of other online resources um, that vet charities and um, and that have a lot of information out there, I would say don't be too distracted about how much charities spend on administrative costs. I think for a long time, that was the one barometer of impact for a charity. And I think we've learned now that it's not always the best barometer. Sometimes it's very important to have overhead or have administrative costs in order for a charity to do its work. The other question that I'll answer quickly before I turn it over to Nicole, and I've totally run over time, <laughs> um, is about impact investing. And we see impact investing often as a subset of the impact related activities that families will do something that the next gen is very engaged with oftentimes and will bring opportunities to the table. So I think that if you see impact investing as an extension of your charitable work or the work that, um, or how you make impact in the world, I think it's a very appropriate way to have that conversation and to engage the next generation. If you wanna go deeper, especially on some of these issues related to private foundations and how families work together, 
we are actually hosting a webinar later this month specifically on that issue. So if anybody is interested in that, we would be happy to have you and you can just ping one of us if you if you would like to participate. But with that, I will hand it over to Nicole um, and I apologize for going over time. <laughs> Thank you, Adrian, and don't apologize. That's always, I think, the most interesting part. Um, so now that we've covered the why, I'm going to cover the what. So what can you give to charity? Um, and we often think about this in terms of time, talent, and treasure. And I know Karen will talk more about that and the different ways that you can further your philanthropic mission. I'm going to focus on the treasure piece, so which assets um, you can give to charity. And before I jump in, I just want everyone to keep in mind that in terms of your charitable contribution deduction, that will depend on a number of factors, including your adjusted gross income, what you give, in terms of which asset you give and what type of vehicle you use. So if, if offsetting taxes is part of your goal or especially if you're making a large gift, you'll want to consult with your advisors before doing that. Like Adrian said, pitch a big tent and include everyone that's relevant to that conversation to make sure that you're getting the most out of your gift as well as the charity. I also wanted to mention quickly the tax proposals that have been floating around that were introduced a few weeks ago. Those are still being worked out in Congress. However, they do pose um, significant tax increases for taxpayers above a certain income threshold. So now could be an even more attractive time to, to give to your favorite charities um, if you fall into that bucket. Um, and again, just be sure to consult with your advisors to make sure that you're making the most impact there. Okay, so I'm gonna start off with what you can give if you're trying to keep it simple. Um, here is cash is, is always easy. That's easy for you as the donor. It's easy for the charity, they get the funds very quickly. Um, there is also a higher deduction for taxpayers who itemize um, actually under the CARES Act, which was introduced last year to provide COVID-19 relief. Um, cash contributions that are made directly to public charities are deductible 100% against your AGI. So if you are thinking about making a cash gift to a public charity, um, now is a good time to do that before year end to, to maximize your deduction. Some drawback to giving cash is that there's no leveraging your deduction as you have um, that option with other assets, which I'll talk about in a minute with appreciated assets. And it also requires that you have cash on hand that you're willing to part with, which may not always be the case. Another thing that's pretty simple to give is tangible personal property. So things like artwork, books, even vintage clothing or other collectibles um, may be used by a charity, either if they're putting them on display like a museum or they may sell them um, and then use the cash for their, for their purposes. Um, perhaps they're having a charitable auction or something like that. So this can be a good option um, if you have heirlooms and collectibles that you want to make sure are cared for and stored properly over time, or if you think that they might be sold, that you're hoping that they go to a loving home um, someday with someone who will continue to enjoy them as much as you did. Something to keep in mind when you're giving tangibles is that you will need a qualified appraisal in order to get your deduction. Um, that will tell you how much that is worth for, for the deduction purposes. And also that not all charities, charities take tangible personal property. So you'll want to consult with the organization beforehand and you'll want to make sure that you understand the options of what they might do with your property. If you're not okay with them selling it, you would want to know that beforehand. Okay, so next, moving on to appreciated assets. So this is all about leveraging your deduction. So here, if you donate appreciated assets, like long-term appreciated securities that you've held for over one year or cryptocurrency, um, you can donate these directly to a charity, which will in turn sell it. Um, tax-free and then be able to keep all the proceeds and you'll get the deduction for your for your contribution. This is a much um, better technique from a tax standpoint than you selling those assets, paying capital gains tax, and then donating the leftover cash. So this really maximizes your deduction and also maximizes the amount that gets into the hands of charity. Um, some potential drawbacks with donating these assets are that it's not always possible to get the exact amount. So if you want to donate $500,000 on the dot to a charity, um, you might not be able to get there with your appreciated securities or your cryptocurrency. So you might need to get as close as you can and then top it off with cash, which is not a big deal. Um, also, if you're trying to make multiple, perhaps smaller donations, maybe at the end of the year, this can become cumbersome, but there is a pretty easy fix there. 
You could utilize um, a vehicle like a donor advised fund, which I think Karen will touch upon, and you could donate the appreciated assets to the donor advised fund, which would in turn sell it, and then you could make the cash gifts out of there. So that's a pretty easy fix as well. A couple things to keep in mind if you're donating cryptocurrency is that you, you may need an appraisal to get your deduction. And you also just want to make sure that the charity does have an e-wallet that will accept currency. And I was excited to hear that UVA does have a Coinbase wallet. So for those of you savvy investors out there, um, donating your cryptocurrency to UVA is an option. Okay, so moving on to another great technique for leveraging your deduction is donating an interest in a privately held business. Um, so this is great for owners of private businesses that are philanthropically in kind and also have um, perhaps a sale or a transaction on the horizon in the future. Uh, we like to call this a twofer because you get the upfront income tax deduction for the value of the business that you donate to charity, and then you also reduce your capital gains exposure. So as an example, if I own 100% of a privately held business, and I think I might sell my business next year, and I'm philanthropically inclined, I could donate 10% of the business to a charity, either directly to charity or to a donor advice fund or to a private foundation. And then upon, I would get the upfront deduction for that 10%, I would have to get an independent appraisal to figure out what that's worth. And then later, if it's sold next year, I only have to pay capital gains tax on 90% because the 10% that went to charity is not subject to tax. So that's a great double benefit there. Um, some drawbacks include, I mentioned that you have to get an independent appraisal for the portion that you donate. It's likely that your interest will be discounted, um, perhaps for lack of marketability because it's privately held and lack of control if you donate a minority interest. These discounts are very good for other types of planning when you're trying to transfer assets to children and grandchildren. Not as great for charitable planning because it means that the value of your deduction will be discounted a little bit. But kind of is what it is, and that's just something to keep in mind. Um, another thing to be careful of is the assignment of income doctrine, which says that you cannot divert your tax liability to other entities. So you want to make sure that you do this type of planning in advance enough of a sale that it's not a virtual certainty that that sale will happen. And then finally, um, if you don't have liquid assets that you're ready to part with right now, you could look at your other assets like your retirement accounts and life insurance to see if you could further your charitable mission using those assets. So for retirement accounts, there's an option called a qualified charitable distribution or QCD. And this allows you to distribute up to $100,000 per year from your IRA beginning at age 70 and a half to qualified charities. And if you are subject to RMDs, which now kick in at age 20, uh, 72, this is a great option because up to $100,000 of your RMD will be excluded from income because your RMDs are typically included as taxable income. So if you are in that bucket where you're 72 and you're subject to RMDs, but you don't need that money, this is a great way to benefit charity. You just have to send the money directly from your IRA to the charity and you won't miss it if you didn't need the money anyways. Um, some drawbacks is that if your RMD is less than $100,000, you can still make the $100,000 gift, but that excess doesn't carry over to next year. So the next year you would still have the full RMD amount that you have to deal with either by taking it or again, doing another um, QCD. And QCDs may not be made to a donor advice fund or a private foundation. It has to go directly to the qualified charity. If you're not subject to RMDs or if you do need the RMDs during your lifetime, you could also look at designating a charity as the beneficiary for your retirement account. This also works for life insurance. Um, these are great options if you don't have assets that you're ready to part with right now. And if you're very interested in flexibility, because you can always change these designated beneficiary forms anytime during your lifetime. Um, so that, that's good flexibility. You also get an estate tax charitable deduction. So that is a benefit to these gifts. Some drawbacks, and Adrian touched upon this, is that you don't get the benefit of seeing the gift, the impact of your gift, because the charity won't receive these funds until you pass away. Um, someone had a question about the SECURE Act and stretch IRA, so I'll cover that here as we're talking about retirement accounts. Um, so the SECURE Act was passed in 2019 and dealt with retirement accounts, and it is true that the SECURE Act did eliminate stretch IRAs 
for non, most non-spouse beneficiaries. So prior to the SECURE Act, if your children inherited your IRA, they were able to roll it over into their own IRA and stretch out the RMDs over their lifetime, giving them the benefit of tax deferral over their lifetime. Post-SECURE Act, again, for most non-spouse beneficiaries, there's now a 10-year period following the death of the account owner over which the account needs to be paid out. So that accelerates the income tax hit there because again, RMDs are taxable income. So from a ta an income tax standpoint, IRAs might not be the best asset to leave to your kids anymore. They are still good to leave to spouses because spouses can roll them over into their own account. Um, so if you are looking at your estate in a big picture sense and you have other assets that you could leave to your children, that might be more beneficial, especially if those assets under current law are eligible for a step up in basis for income tax purposes. And then you could leave the IRA to charity. This is another part where it's important to pitch a big tent and include your advisors and make sure that this planning fits into your plan overall and that you're taking a really holistic look at all of your assets um, and being strategic in what you're leaving to family and what you're leaving to philanthropy to maximize your impact and the tax um, impact of that giving. Another thing to keep in mind is that Roth IRAs are not taxable, so they are still subject to that 10-year payout rule, but the RMDs are not taxable for beneficiaries, so Roth IRAs may still be an attractive asset to leave to your kids as long as you're okay with that 10-year payout. And one more thing just to mention about life insurance is many people buy life insurance for the purpose of providing their estate liquidity to pay estate taxes when they pass away. So again, another thing to keep in mind with your advisors when you're thinking about this giving is if you do designate charity as your life insurance beneficiary, you just want to make sure that um, that liquidity is coming from somewhere else when you pass away to pay those estate taxes. One more question I, I will cover before I pass off to Karen. Um, someone had a question about, could you create a sort of stretch IRA using a charitable remainder trust? And I know Karen will talk about CRTs more, um, but I'll just cover this question now. So you can name a charity, um, I'm sorry, you can name a CRT as the benefit of your um, retirement account and kind of create this, this stretch in a post-secure act world. And how this, is work, how this would work is that the charitable remainder trust would sell the IRA assets when you pass away and then pay an income stream to the named beneficiaries, whether it's your spouse or kids or others, um, either during the lifetime of the beneficiaries or for a term, term of years. Um, you do still need to follow the CRT rules, including that the value of the charitable remainder interest has to be at least 10% of the value of the trust. So your advisors will be able to run projections, but this might impact the term of the income beneficiary's interest. So if you have a very young beneficiary, if you have young kids, they may not be able to stretch this out over their lifetime because the 10% test would fail. So they might be subject to maybe a 10 or 15 or 20 year term. So you might still get to the same place that you would if you had named them as the beneficiary of the IRA themselves. You might still be subject to a shorter term than you would have wished. Um, this can also be a less flexible approach than naming the children as the beneficiaries of the IRA because the beneficiary either gets a fixed amount or a fixed percentage of the CRT during their term. So if they needed more assets, if there was an emergency or something like that, they may not be able to get to that, whereas they would if they had just been beneficiaries of the IRA. And finally, your estate tax charitable contribution deduction would be limited to the value of the charitable remainder interest. Um, whereas if you had just named a charity as the beneficiary of the IRA, you get the full deduction there. So those are all things to keep in mind with that technique, but it is available as an option. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Karen, who's going to talk Thank about you. the how. Yeah. Well, now we know about our impact, what we're going to give and uh, why. Uh, the last piece before you push the button is how. Uh, what type of gift are you going to make? What's the format? And um, we can go from simple to unbelievably complicated, so complicated that we don't have time to explain it. So we're just going to give you a sense of the sorts of hows um, and methodologies you can use to give. Um, so the approach to figuring out the how is going to involve weighing a number of factors. First is your tax deduction. Some techniques will give you a great tax deduction, some won't. But I will caution you, don't let the tax tail wag the dog. The guiding star should be impact, I think as Adrian made, made wonderfully clear. 
Um, also, some techniques will reduce taxes. So you may have appreciated stock, uh, appreciated privately held business shares, as Nicole explained. You might be able to avoid the gain uh, on those shares by donating them to charity. So we weigh not only a tax deduction, but the plain old avoidance of taxes. Also, some of these techniques will allow you to have a snowball effect with your investment returns. So let's say you have a really great private equity fund or you just think Apple stock is the greatest thing ever. Um, you can set aside those assets for charity and have them potentially grow, uh, having really tax deferred or potentially tax-free investment returns earmarked for your favorite charities. Last, uh, one of the things we think about in the how to give is really the time and incentives. So in thinking about a structured gift, maybe you have something big in mind you'd really like to do for a charity and you're gonna spread it out over a number of years so you and the charity can collaborate on the project. The charity can hit certain milestones and you can check those boxes along the way. I wouldn't say really a carrot and a stick because accountable charities really don't need a stick, but more of a long-term collaboration. So, so that's another factor you'll think about as you think about how to give, simple or complicated. I just wanted to also give you a bit of advice about the advisors you're gonna have around the table. If you're just doing something really simple, you're making an immediate cash outright gift, you know, you could probably do that around the dinner table with your family and even have a multi-generational conversation about it. Uh, don't lose the opportunity to think about the impact of, of more simple and less complicated gifts. Um, but as you think about more of those charitable trusts, some of the techniques we're gonna close out talking about today, you might wanna have your tax and legal advisors at the table thinking about what's best for your financial situation. Um, and there is a whole cottage industry, some of whom are amazingly effective of consultants in the philanthropic area. So if you're doing something truly large and innovative, you know, we're talking kind of the million dollar plus level at a minimum, you may want to involve a philanthropic advisor that can really focus your impact and effectiveness. Um, so don't, don't forget to involve advisors when appropriate, because again, it can really enhance the impact of the how. Um, starting with the simple, again, we talked about those sort of direct uh, outright gifts, uh, cash, securities, per Nicole's comments. Um, a pledge as well, you can, you can make a commitment to make some now, some later. Um, that allows the charity to plan and uh, forecast their fundraising dollars. If they're kicking off a new project and you make a pledge, it really helps them to kind of have that future income coming in. Um, also, one of the things that's really popular among our clients and people that really are worried that they're not gonna have enough wealth during their life to give big to philanthropy, but they really wanna give big because they have big hearts. Well, the win-win is to just give when you die, right? After you've made sure that you and your family are taken care of, you can give some of your excess funds to your favorite charities in your will uh, and in your estate plan. And that can be tremendously effective because you're avoiding those dreadful estate taxes. Um, you know, on, on wealthy individuals, there are often estate taxes when wealth hits family members. Well, there are no estate taxes when wealth hits to charity. So uh, that, that's a moment when you can really amplify um, the tax impacts. Um, indirect, the, these going from kind of up a little bit more complexity, um, we have donor advised funds and private foundations. A donor advised fund is simply an account at, uh, that is managed or owned by a philanthropic organization whereby the donor of the assets, the person that puts the stuff into the account, gets to make recommendations to the charitable owner on where money goes to charity and when, right? So, you know, I may put in, you know, 100 shares of Apple stock into my donor advice fund account. Um, those are often managed by community foundations or uh, the philanthropic arm of financial institutions like Fidelity, Schwab, um, and I then get to make recommendations to Schwab, Fidelity, local community advised, uh, community foundation on where the money goes and when. I tell them give, you know, $100,000 a year in year one to UVA, and typically they heed the uh, donor advisor's recommendations. Now, there, there are very rarely any significant 
requirements on how fast the money has to go out to charity. So these are great vehicles um, if you're thinking about multi-generational giving, because you can literally wait, you know, I can set aside a donor advice fund and say, this is not for my philanthropic giving, this is for my kids' philanthropic giving, and they're gonna have to figure it out. So it allows really kind of families to defer um, impactful conversations about when they'd like to give and how. Donor advice funds are really easy to set up. Most have something basic like a $5,000 minimum fund level, uh, and um, there are no annual filing requirements. There are no annual taxes. Super easy breezy. The philanthropic organization that owns the account handles all of the administrative aspects of which there are a few. Um, going more complicated, a private foundation. Word from the advisor community is you really need to put aside $3 million or more of value to have the complexity of a private foundation be worth it. A private foundation is just a trust or a corporation that a family sets up. They donate assets into the trust or corporation, and it's used for now, next, later, future giving as they seem appropriate. Tax returns are required. Adrian mentioned those 990s that are filed for charities. You got to do that with your private foundation, so it's a little bit more onerous uh, or potentially a lot more onerous than a donor advised fund. Um, and there are, are minimum distribution requirements and there are some small taxes. Um, so a little bit harder to feed in water. That's why you really got to have a little bit more, you know, frankly, financial assets and more value uh, to make it worth it. But you can do typically a lot more visionary things through a private foundation. The IRS lets you, because it is a private family philanthropic entity, a donor advised fund, for example, is a public charity. Um, they let you get away with a little bit more close to the vest, uh, you know, opportunities with private foundations. You got a little bit more uh, vision you can you do with things like scholarships, um, and real programs. Um, so, so some families do favor them for those reasons. A couple of um, things to note with private foundations or donor advised funds, going back to pledges, it's really important that you not use your donor advised funds or private foundation funds to satisfy a personal binding pledge. So if I make a 10 year commitment to UVA and I make it in my own personal name, I really can't use my donor advised fund funds um, or private foundation assets to satisfy that pledge. Now you could make the pledge in the name of your private foundation from the beginning, right? That solves the problem. And how we're doing it these days with donor advised fund gifts is we do gift letters whereby we set out an intention uh, to make a recommendation from our donor advised fund to, for example, UVA over a 10 year period. And we let UVA know it's our intention to do that. that that's really about as far as we can go with a binding pledge from a donor advised fund, because remember the donor advised fund is really owned by that charity, you know, Schwab Charitable, Fidelity Charitable, et cetera, that you trust with those funds. Really quick, uh, next slide here, just some best practices. If you're making a substantial gift, you know, $200,000 or whatever is substantial to your family, you know, maybe substantial to your family is larger than that. It might be nice to set aside some specific intentions with respect to the gift in a gift agreement with a charity. It's going to look a little bit like a contract and you're going to set forth your intentions um, for the, the use of the funds with charity. And, and delayed gifts too, you know, if you're going to give a certain amount over the course of 5, 10, 20 years for a big project, you can also set aside, you know, I'll give you the next amount when you do this, you know, when you've broken ground, when you've got the occupancy permit for the building in, in my name or what have you. Um, and that really just helps you and the charity come to a meeting of the minds on what this project or what your, what your use is really gonna look like to avoid arguments. You know, we are seeing a question that came in was, you know, um, can I revoke my gift if I really don't like the charity's kind of political um, causes? Um, well, no, you can't, unless, unless you've done something in violation of this gift agreement or in violation of law, really once you've made a binding commitment to charity or you've given them money, that's sort of it. You, you, they have it and you have to make good on your commitment. Um, I would say be careful with politically minded uh, elements in gift agreements, especially with universities. 
universities really have to deliver their faculty uh, political and academic independence. That's really the way that they can foster effective research. Um, so it, it's kind of a trend these days to really try to keep very kind of down the middle gift agreements um, because there's been some, I'm here in Chicago, so if here in Chicago, there has been some turbulence in the academic community for that. So just be careful. That's gonna be something that a charity, not just universities, really any charity is gonna, gonna wanna avoid and donors have to play this on the straight and narrow. Next slide, please, Nicole. Um, just a minute or two here on some more complicated methods of giving. These can definitely amplify your tax deduction. So, you know, they can be very much worth doing, although it's going to involve hiring an attorney to draft a trust and set up uh, a charitable vehicle. Um, probably one of the most common is, for, for again, a larger gift, um, is a charitable trust. A charitable trust can be done one of two ways. Um, in, in a charitable trust, either the donor, the donor's family, or the charity get either payments during the term of the trust agreement, maybe we're doing five, 10 years, or the donor's life, right? That's called the lead interest, right? So during the term, I get a little annuity or, or payment for a number of years. And then the second thing you get from the charitable trust, you or the charity will get, um, is the remainder interest. After however long the trust is supposed to last, what's left at the end and who gets that? And basically the donor or the donor's family and the charity gets one or the other of those techniques. A charitable remainder trust is where the charity gets that end interest and a charitable lead trust is where the, where the uh, donor gets that term interest uh, sorry, the charity gets the term interest and the donor is going to get that remainder interest or the donor's family. The things you're going to want to weigh here on um, what's right for you, a charitable remainder trust or a charitable lead trust, you need your advisors at the table in this conversation. This is not a DIY exercise or what's your tax deduction going to be? What are you going to fund it with? Are you trying to avoid a massive unrealized gain? And frankly, interest rates. These days, with interest rates being low, charitable remainder trusts are sort of a unique animal. You have to have some funky assets to do that. We're not really doing those as much. They're not as impactful uh, for you or the charity. Closing out, a charitable gift annuity is another more complicated, potentially a uh, high impact tool whereby you give a charity property. Could be cash, could be appreciated securities. And the charity gives you back a typically a lifetime annuity. And um, typically part of that annuity payment is going to be taxable and potentially part of it won't be. So it's a way to kind of share in the value uh, of the asset with charity, with giving them something now and you getting something back uh, in the end. I think we've saved a few minutes for questions, probably not long enough. Um, Turning it back over to you, Heather. Great, thank you. So yes, we have about, I don't know, seven minutes left. So we have a few questions here and I will share them with you and you guys can decide who's gonna answer them. Um, the first one, can you talk a little bit about bequests versus beneficiary designations of say a retirement account since they both take place at death? How do you choose which one you're gonna use? I can jump in there. So a bequest is a gift that you leave either in your will or your revocable trust, whereas a beneficiary designation applies to retirement accounts or life insurance. So it really goes back to just which assets you're trying to leave to charity. So if it's the retirement account or the life insurance, that goes on a beneficiary designation form that you would fill out with the custodian of those accounts. Whereas if you're looking at your other assets, kind of your non-probate assets in your estate when you pass away, like your cash, investments, real estate, things like that, those all fall into your estate when you pass away and either are governed by your will or if you have one, a revocable trust. If you want the gift to come out of those assets, then you would do the bequest um, and put that into your estate plan. Great, thank you. I think each of you mentioned at one point or another, potentially bringing in tax advisors and legal advisors. What's the best way to go about finding a tax advisor or a 
legal advisor or anyone else to help you with this. <laughs> That's only choose really UVA alums and you'll be <laughs> in good we shape. We only hire UVA alums. So. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you want to take a shot at that, Karen? Oh, um, it's a hard question. Yeah, I know. Um, you know, referrals and word of mouth is really the best way to go, I think, in my opinion. Um, you know, there's nothing like having, being able to talk to somebody that's worked with an advisor for a long time and uh, given you a reference. That, that's honestly how we get a lot of our clients by, you know, people that have worked with us for a long time and are, you know, spread the word about the advice, the good advice. Yeah. I, I would, you know, the only thing I'd add to that is ask somebody who is like you. Um, so if, you know, if you're a public company CEO, ask another public company CEO, or if you're a real estate developer, or if you're, you know, like ask somebody who's in your, in your network, who has sort of a similar amount of assets and complexity in their lives. Um, oftentimes, you know, we do see, um, folks with a lot of complexity looking at advisors who might not be suitable because they got a really earnest referral from somebody, um, who had a great experience, which is good but it just might not be a fit because of that reason. We've actually, not to be too promotional, but we've written a piece around how do you select um, specifically a wealth management advisor that's on our website. It's called Top 10 Tips or something in hiring um, a wealth management professional. And, you know, there are certain things like fees and relationship module, you know, different ways that um, firms decide to serve clients that are all very relevant when you're looking um, to hire an advisor. But I completely agree with Karen's advice, which is, Word of mouth is a great idea. Great, thank you. The only thing I'll add is that you can, if you have one advisor, you could start there. Um, so, you know, Karen and Adrian and I work very closely with our clients, accountants, and attorneys. So we're always providing referrals for those other advisors for our clients. So if you have one advisor that you trust, you could ask them for some referrals. Great idea. Great. And we've gotten a lot of questions about family foundations. Um, they've come in in a couple different ways from, you know, can you discuss the difference between just writing a check versus setting up a family foundation? Or what's really the threshold? If I'm thinking about giving away $5 million over 10 years, should I set up a family foundation? So what are some of the considerations around setting up a family foundation? Yeah, we, we it's funny. I bet we all have a different answer to this <laughs> based on our own personal experience. Um, from my experience, I'd say 90% of the time, the answer is don't set up a foundation because there's so many better ways to do it. And donor advised funds are provide 90% of the benefits with 10% of the complexity and uh, compliance work. So most people who are thinking about a foundation, you can create a, a foundation and look and feel with actually not having that operating model and using a donor advised fund to sort of your back end, let's put it that way. Uh, where you wanna give grants to individuals, where you wanna give overseas, where you have sort of a lot of sophistication in your, in your grant making strategy, you might wanna investigate a foundation, or you want to actually operate a charity, do programmatic work, then you might want to think about a private foundation. But if you don't have that type of complexity, you want to give away $5 million in 10 years, there's no real reason if you don't have one of those things going on not to use a DAF uh, would be my Add to that, specific you know, advice. <laughs> if, you're, um, if you want to hire individuals, mm -hmm. directly hire, not again, a consultant, but you want someone full-time um, to really manage your philanthropy. And it could even be a family member. Maybe you pay your you know, daughter or what have you to focus on philanthropy. That's another situation where a private foundation is, is absolutely essential. I, just I also wanna point out that you can change your mind. You can start with a private foundation and go to a donor advised fund. You can say, to heck with this, this is too much work. I'm gonna just distribute all the private, the private foundation's assets to a donor advised fund, but you cannot do the reverse. If you start out as a donor advice fund, you can't change your mind and collapse yourself into a private foundation. Mm -hmm. And I think the real difference is whether you are going to be strategic or whether you are going to have, you know, and this is our shorthand checkbook philanthropy, right? You just write checks when people ask you for a check versus being um, intentional about mission and impact and engagement and decision-making process. All of those things can happen without having a family foundation because that's the governance structure that you will use to govern your philanthropy, regardless of whether you're doing it out of a DAF 
whether you're doing it out of a charitable trust, whether you're doing it out of a foundation, or you're simply writing a check as you see fit or giving away some asset. So I would separate uh, the structure, the legal structure of your chair, your charitable giving from how the governance structure, because you can have all of that around governance. You can have a board, an informal board that includes all of your family members. You can think about how you make those decisions together. You can have meetings of the board of trustees. You can do all of those things without actually having the, the foundation structure. And unfortunately, we are out of time. I'm so sad because we have some really good other questions here. Um, I would love to thank our panelists, our tech team, and then all of our participants for joining us today. We will be setting out, sending out a follow-up email to everyone who participated, and we will include in there um, instructions on how you can get the slides. This has been recorded, so where the video is. And also, we've had some questions about the BB&H webinar at the end of the month, so we will put that, up, that in our follow-up email as well. So thank you to everyone, and I hope you all have a fabulous day. Thank you. Thank you.